morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending on which place on earth you are located. We are extremely uh, happy to be given this plenary session to present the results of the UN SDSN Senior Working Group on the European Green Deal. I am uh, Phoebe Kunduri. I'm a professor at the Athens University of Economics and Business and the Technical University of Denmark, and also leading the Sustainable Development Unit at Athena uh, Research Center on Information Technologies. I'm also chairing the SDSN Global Climate Hub and SDSN European Hub. In these very difficult times of uh, multiple crises, the pandemic, the economic recession, together with increasing inflation lately, the climate change crisis, the biodiversity collapse, the 2021 energy crisis that is being um, uh, even uh, more um, uh, aggravated by the geopolitical crisis in the Ukraine and the resulting food crisis, the population crisis and the increasing inequality around the world gives a very difficult picture uh, of uh, the status quo of uh, the global economy and society and uh, um, the interaction of these two with the environment and really put us on a stagnating position with regards to the implementation of the only global agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 SDGs, 169 targets. This is how the performance across the world at national level looks like. We are far behind with regards to implementing the goals and we need to find solution pathways that will accelerate the process of implementation. Because the SDGs are not just a description of the world we would like, the future we want. The SDGs are an investment program that should be specified for each nation according to the idiosyncratic features of each and every country. It is an investment plan and the performance with regards to this investment plan can be quantified and assessed and monitored. And within this framework, uh, the senior working group of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network on the European Green Deal every year is producing a report on financing the joint implementation of the SDGs and the European Green Deal. We are trying to identify the uh, synergies, the correlation, the connection between what is being done in Europe and the implementation of the global agenda as um, it is presented in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. This senior working group is led by Jeff Sachs and myself and includes many important institutions around the globe. Uh, in addition to the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the European Association of Environmental Resource Economics, um, for which I'm the elected president, IFORIA, the Alliance of Excellence for Research and Innovation on IFORIA, a combination of research institutions, innovation accelerators, and uh, science, um, policy interface networks and academies and associations that try to tries to sketch science driven pathways to sustainability with us we have NL foundation EIT climate kick force for good the international energy agency the world academy of art and science the university of rome the cyprus institute 
the Athens University of Economics and Business and Athena Research Center. Together we have uh, with us, and I'm very honored that the, the uh, I would say, um, prominent members of this uh, working group, the people who are putting the, the hours and the thought and the effort and their team to support this uh, annual um, report are with us and you can see them on the screen to present the results of the section that they contributed to the report. So we have Professor Leonardo Pecchetti, uh, from the University of Rome, Kedan Patel, CEO of Greater Pacific Capital and founder of um, um, Force for Good, Miss Elenia Romani, uh, PhD from the um, uh, Fondazione Eni Enrico de Matei from FIM and Professor Theodoro Zachariadis from the Cyprus Institute and um, manager at SDSN Europe, where we also work together. Now, basically what we tried to do in the first chapter of this report is to connect the global and European network, which are uh, uh, global and European array of policies and initiatives and uh, laws and regulations, and uh, try to find the connection between them and the connection between whatever is happening in, in Europe that is considered a leadership example uh, for the sustainability transition and the SDGs. So what is the connection between the 17 sustainable development goals and the 169 targets? The Paris Agreement, the a global agreement for um, uh, climate change of uh, signed in 2015 uh, by all members of, of the UN trying to uh, keep the increase in average global temperature below two degrees and even below 1.5 degrees Celsius as it it, is, uh, it has proven to be necessary uh, in the 2018 IPCC report. So we have the European Green Deal with uh, the uh, aim for climate neutrality and clean tech leadership of European companies and reduction of pollution and leaving no one behind. We have the next generation EU, which is 750 billion in addition to the European multi-annual financial framework enacted in 2020 when we had COVID. And this 750 billion, thankfully we managed even um, within the era of this huge uh, COVID-19 non-linearity, we managed to earmark this 750 billion to the green and digital transition. And then in 2021, we have a further elaboration of the nine European Green Deal policies and various uh, relevant uh, strategies. We have the announcement of the European Climate Law, the EU taxonomy, the Fit for 55. And in 2022, the efforts of the European Union to uh, address the energy crisis and the geopolitical crisis, mainly transposed into a uh, repower EU, focusing on independence from Russian fossil fuel, supply chain, security and in the interconnectivity and investing in renewables. Together with that, a huge initiative, Destination Earth, to create the digital twin of Europe. So we seem to be quite focused on the green and digital transition. There is a huge array of policies, initiatives, directives, regulations, laws, etc. 
and we want to see how closely this uh, framework of policies is related to the SDGs. And we grouped all these policies uh, together. These make up uh, hundreds of thousands of pages. And we pose the question, do European Green Deal policies facilitate the implementation of the SDGs? And uh, we uh, tried two methods to, uh, uh, in order to answer these questions. We had a human text mining and machine learning um, uh, text mining. In the human text mine, uh, uh, mining approach, we find that the most significant impact of the European Green Deal policies um, it refers to accelerating climate adaptation, SDG 13, it refers to SDG 9, which is about sustainable industry innovation and infrastructure, SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, SDG 12, responsible consumption production, and SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. In our uh, deep learning approach, using these very large neural networks with many layers that basically simulate the way the human mind works, we find uh, that the European Green Deal facilitates affordable and clean energy, SDG 7, industry innovation and infrastructure, SDG 9, SDG 12, uh, responsible consumption and protection, SDG 13, climate action, and SDG 17, partnerships for the goals. So the, there is a, a consistency between the two text mining approaches, but the deep learning approach also gives us the result that we have very low correlation with regards to the social cohesion SDGs. The European Clean Green Deal is not efficient, is not effective, is not clever enough to integrate the uh, goals of no poverty, quality education, gender equality, which are important for social cohesion, and then is rings a bell um, of um, non uh, uh, cohesion, uh, non -co social cohesion, which translate to the fact that the uh, just transition, the uh, inclusiveness access of the European Green Deal is not really transposed in any of the policies or is transposed in the policies, but to a lower than necessary degree. And to showcase this a bit more clearly, we use the six transformation operations rationalization framework of the SDGs, which basically um, maps the 17 goals into six transformation, education, health, energy, decarbonization, sustainable food, land, water, and ocean, sustainable cities and communities, and the digital revolution for sustainable development. And what we find when we try to transpose our results into this six transformation framework, we find an additional confirmation that the European Green Deal policies are quite robust in um, facilitating transformation for that refers to sustainable food, land, water, and oceans, and transformation three with regards to energy decarbonization and sustainable industry. It's moderately efficient in uh, facilitating sustainable cities and communities and the digital revolution for sustainable development, but it is quite weak with regards to education and health, well-being and demography. So we find that the SDGs are a more holistic framework than the European Green Deal. So we really need a joint implementation of the European Green Deal and the SDGs in the bigger framework of the SDG that takes good care of uh, social cohesion. So one could follow the lead of the Minister of Infrastructure and Sustainable Mobility of Italy and 
basically implement the European Green Deal, but assess each and every investment that is um, there to enable the implementation of the European Green Deal against all the SDGs, so that we choose the projects that are good for energy efficiency and decarbonization and protecting natural resources and the digital transformation, but at the same time, they care about social cohesion. Without social cohesion, no transformation is possible. Without social cohesion, you, may, uh, you cannot uh, convince the adoption of the technologies and the new governance structures that are needed for the transformation. The second question that we pose is, does the European semester process facilitate the implementation of the SDGs. And basically what we did, we used the connection between SDGs and the European Green Deal. And then we tried to see whether uh, the challenges uh, faced by each and every country in Europe with regards to their SDG performance are being dealt with via the semester process recommendation of the European Commission. The semester process recommendations gives recommendations with regards to fiscal policies and investments in green and digital transition, taxation, social policies, education, skills, public administration, and so on. So what we try to do is to see whether uh, in the areas where you have very low performance with regards to the SDGs, the areas that are marked on the uh, left hand side of this slide as red or orange or even yellow are areas where the semester process gives recommendations to the country, i.e. it says you need to invest more on these areas in order to come closer to the European average. And uh, we find that in Sweden, we have 50% alliance, in Germany, 63%, in Greece, 80%. And in looking at the different 27 European countries, we find 72% alignment, which is high, but there is obviously still space for further alignment. Do the national recovery and resilience plans facilitate the implementation of the SDGs? Well, um, Theo Zachariades will tell you much more about this. This derived from his work on the seven South European um, countries, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Slovenia, and Spain. The message from this work is that uh, the stimulus measures and the budget allocation of the recovery and resilience funds are, of course, um, facilitating SDG performance and implementation, but they are not always those on which the countries face the biggest sustainability challenges. We find that the biggest sustainability challenges um, uh, that refer to sustainable food systems and diets, biodiversity goals are not addressed in RFFs, while a lot of uh, money, a lot of investment is placed on green energy electrification of transport and energy efficiency measures. This rings a bell uh, to the uh, national governments indicating the need for additional cohesion funds that are anyway coming in to be spent on areas or, uh, that are relevant to transforming food systems, diets, and biodiversity goal. Does sustainable finance um, have a good um, uh, structure in Europe? And is, is it really integrating the value of natural capital? As we all know, in order to produce something, you need to produce capital, natural capital, and human capital. And it has been proven in the last 50 years uh, through various studies on non-market valuation of natural capital that almost always the biggest component of value in production processes derives from the value of natural capital. So uh, here is a big need to identify, quantify, and monetize the value of natural capital. And in this report, we propose a method um, um, uh, by um, categorizing 
uh, the different uh, services of natural capital uh, in the so-called ecosystem services, provision in regulating culture and habitat services, and then using uh, econometric methodologies that allow us to monetize, to identify the willingness to pay of uh, people, of households, um, in order to conserve or increase the quantity and the quality of these ecosystem services. And we do this for terrestrial, marine, and freshwater ecosystem services for all the biogeographical and marine regions of uh, Europe, 14 regions. And we do a meta-analysis benefit transfer that allows us to estimate the marginal willingness to pay by ecosystem service by each household in each and every country of Europe. And not only that, uh, we also investigate the a correlation between uh, willingness to pay for natural capital and SDG uh, performance, and we find a very strong positive correlation, which indicates that in countries where there is strong awareness of the value of natural capital, and there is explicit willingness to pay for the services of natural capital in production and consumption processes, in those countries we find very good performance with regards to the SDGs. And finally, we come in to say something about the long-run discount rate and um, address the question of how do we take care of the long-run benefits that climate policies uh, will uh, bring uh, using a cost and discount rate uh, usually um, uh, uh, translates uh, any benefits that come into the far future approximately equal to zero. We argue here based on a series of papers that we did that uh, the um, correct uh, discount rate, long run discount rate, it's a function of time and it's a declining function of time. And we propose an econometric methodology that allows us to estimate the time declining pathways of discount rate for each and every country we have data. Finally, we uh, um, showcase uh, an econometric analysis that uh, makes the connection between ESG, environmental, social and governance uh, performance and and uh, financial performance. And we find that uh, a sound ESG performance uh, produces and implies good financial performance, lower systemic grade, improved profit margin, and um, uh, better returns and return to equity. I will uh, stop here and ask uh, my um, dear colleague and excellent uh, scientist, um, uh, Leonardo, to come in and give us the results of the sections he contributed to this report. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phoebe. My, my session is... Uh, is a session uh, is basically a policy session and a, a session discussing about the nexus between uh, uh, policy choice for ecological transition and finance. Uh, as we all know, uh, there are at least six reasons why we should accelerate uh, uh, toward uh, uh, um, ecological transition and especially uh, the reduction of, of uh, emissions and uh, the increase of the share of uh, energy uh, generated by renewables. There are climate reasons, there are health reasons, there are price, price volatility reasons, as we know now, for the gas crisis, uh, strategic independence, and the fight against inflation. I would like to emphasize this, uh, as we all know, uh, we uh, the, the price of energy started to rise uh, again uh, uh, in uh, summer 2020 after the end of the toughest part of the COVID restrictions and uh, it has uh, further increased uh, uh, during the after the beginning of the war between Russia and Ukraine I mean, the, the, the Russian invasion but uh, uh, there is also an important side of this inflation that we should take care because uh, 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 if in ecological transition uh, supply demand of uh, uh, the supply of uh, uh, fossil fuels uh, falls more than the demand of fossil fuels. This is going to increase prices. 
So it is very important that the ecological transition accelerate and is not just declared and not realized. So it's very important that households and uh, uh, companies switch uh, from fossil fuels to uh, renewables. And this is going to affect also inflation and uh, therefore uh, uh, well-being of uh, people and the purchasing power, especially now. Uh, we have uh, we need um, lots of investment to 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 achieve our targets, our 2030 and 2050 targets of emissions. Uh, this is a very recent report. And what what we did uh, uh, in my chapter uh, to, is to reason about some methodologies and some policies that can help uh, us to achieve uh, this goal. Uh, first of all, uh, there are two dilemmas in this uh, policy choice. One is about uh, whether we should uh, create incentive uh, ex ante or ex post. So should we give a, should we reward uh, the reduction of emission or should we uh, uh, reward or should we incentivize investment that declare that we will reach this goal? That's one, one choice. And the other important choice is whether we should adopt uh, technological neutrality or not. So just uh, focusing on the goal of uh, reduction without taking position on the technology and on the strategy. As we know, there are very te many technologies uh, uh, competing with each other now, hydrogen and uh, uh, even nuclear or, or carbon capture or whatever, not together with renewal. So this is very, there is a trade-off, of course, in, in this. And uh, uh, a main uh, contribution of our work uh, is uh, what I call the, the do not don't significantly are consistent approach for selecting uh, investment for uh, incentive. So what, what is an ecological transition investment? And what we propose here, uh, a bit differently from the, uh, the approach uh, to, uh, of the green taxonomy, but uh, consistent with it, that uh, what, what, what matters for ecological transition is the dynamics of reduction of emission. So basically what we need to see when we decide whether an investment is uh, adequate or not is to see what is the, the, the change in emission that it generates with respect to the counterfactual. And so basically our approach, which has been tested and experimented uh, in Italy, uh, is an approach that very simple and uh, with very low cost also for companies which shows exactly this point in each of the six DNSH domain, what is the part of that investment to see whether it is consistent or not. And uh, uh, this is going to be applied in, in several directions on our opinion. No? I would say today we should need an inflation reduction plan also in the European Union as we, we, they are doing in the US. And it's very interesting that a plan of 7 billion uh, uh, incentives for switching to renewables uh, has been uh, uh, basically uh, called inflation reduction. So the idea is that this is going to reduce this special, very special kind of inflation, which is basically an energy inflation. The other idea is uh, uh, the contrast for carbon difference, which is, uh, specifically accept the ex post approach and the technologically neutral approach, because it's going to reward uh actions that uh, uh, reduce uh, the uh, achieve the goal of reducing emissions okay uh an example uh, approach which is consistent to what we say in the in the in the report which italy is, is actually following is uh, incentivating uh, investment reducing emission and increasing uh, energy efficiency uh, a, a, an important focus of our work uh, is about environmentally harmful strategies and here i would like to reconnect with what uh, uh, Professor Kunduri was saying that uh, there is a loose uh, connection sometimes between the environmental and the social goals. You know, that the problem of just transition has to be really focused very well. And here we, we have a problem. I, I often listen uh, quite superficially by people who are not very much into the details uh, that we should eliminate environmentally harmful subsidy. It's not that easy because these are money going to special, very important categories of our countries, agricultural workers, lorry drivers, taxi drivers, uh, fishermen. And uh, I mean, uh, it's not easy in terms of social uh, sustainability to just cancel these, uh, these uh, subsidies. 
So basically what we devise in, in the paper is a system which uh, uh, separates the uh, substitution from the income effect. So basically the idea is that we can eliminate the subsidy, eliminating the price, the wrong price incentive by uh, providing an income uh, uh, compensation to these categories in order to avoid, first of all, social unrest, which would make this uh, proposal uh, unfeasible. And that's what uh, that's why they are always there, these environmentally harmful subsidies. Of course, uh, now everything uh, has to was suspended because basically what happened with the uh, uh, increase, with the strong increase of the gas price, uh, it's uh, the equivalent of uh, the removal of the subsidies, but 10 times, 15 times more. So basically, this is going to be done in normal in normal times. The, the DNSH approach is, uh, as we suggest, to be used also in the uh, green bond uh, emissions. And uh, we we emphasize how uh, green bond issues, government uh, green bond issues are quite important also as a form of education for the government to understand uh, uh, which part of this uh, uh, public expenditure is consistent with ecological transition and uh, it creates an incentive to increase that part be because only that part can be admissible for uh, uh, the, the green bond uh, uh, issues, okay, when, when you talk with the investors. Other suggestion for the future that we, we emphasize is uh, increase the, the, the speed of ecological transition by putting uh, uh, renewable energies on all public buildings is something that governments can do soon. And uh, we calculate that in this way, you can create a surplus that can be used even to subsidize uh, families in energy poverty to support the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is the only way by which uh, we can export uh, uh, the ecological transition approach uh, and be competitive uh, in international trade uh, with countries that cannot use our standard or can use uh, 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 below our standards. And the last point I would like to emphasize is the also importance to develop uh, a system of uh, uh, distributed bottom-up uh, production of energy. So the issues of energy communities and districts, uh, there can be an interconnections between families, uh, households and, and companies in this sense which I think is very, very, very important for the future, also for the stability of the system, because uh, producing and uh, consuming instantaneously energy reduces uh, the congestion of uh, uh, high uh, tension uh, uh, system. Okay, Th thanks a lot. That's my point. Thank you very much, Leonardo. Very... Uh very important to be able to bring in the economics and financial tools into all these discussions and identify incentive compatible and cost efficient instruments that can help accelerate the process uh, to uh, moving to a sustainable uh, pathway. And uh, we economists have uh, tried for many years to identify those instruments and they are uh, quite uh, helpful when they work and they, were quite, and they are quite disastrous when they don't work. Uh, so it's um, really a privilege to be able to talk to you who has so much experiment, experience in, in this area of work. And I think what you suggest, it could be a very efficient and helpful um, uh, instruments. Uh, next in, uh, in our conversation, it, it will be um, uh, Kedan, Kedan Patel. Uh, I've uh, introduced him uh, before, but I'm going again. He's the uh, CEO of um, Greater Pacific Capital and also uh, the founder of Force for Good, which is an incredible initiative uh, trying to uh, mobilize the ESG interest and the SDG interest in the business world and the banking and financial sector um, towards becoming efficient in uh, supporting and facilitating the 
transition to um, to sustainability in supporting and facilitating the implementation of the SDGs, and again trying to find incentive compatible ways to do that. Kedan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phoebe, and a, a pleasure to work with you and the team. And uh, great to hear the results that are coming out of this report and how practical and implementable they are too. Uh, let me uh, put forward some of the work that we did uh, as part of our research for Force for Good that contributed to this report. Uh, let me share screen with you on, um, on that too. So if I, if I pick out some of the uh, key conclusions of looking at the finance industry and what we what we did was... Um, yeah, Dan, sorry to interrupt. We don't no. see your slides. We just see your background. Oh, you don't? Okay. First now slide. we do. Now we okay. do. Thank right. you. So um, we, we looked at the change of major events in the world and how they impact the flow of capital and clearly... Our research uh, in the report was looking at last year, and we had found that there was a massive allocation to the SDGs. And finishing 2021, we would have concluded that capital kept being allocated to the SDGs, but the SDG gap kept rising. But we finished COP26 with the view that the world, um, despite having fallen short on the targets really required to make a difference, um, there were substantial agreements on many things, including methane and deforestation, uh, carbon uh, and restrictions uh, to some great extent on that too, but not quite getting to where we needed to get to, but still optimistic. The first six months of the year clearly shake that, as we've just heard, um, on things such as inflation and the supply chain and the security issues. And so as we update that data, we find that the security requirements uh, are multidimensional. They include food and the economy and military. And if we add that up to 2030 with some projections, we find that you would need approximately $60 trillion to fund the multidimensional nature of security. Now, that $60 trillion that potentially, if, if we were living in a more stable, peaceful, prosperous world, would, would be directed towards the SDGs. If we take the SDGs, and we update the data that we, we had last year, uh, we find the following, that, uh, and I will concentrate only on the headlines of this, that the cost of meeting the SDG goals overall has gone up something like 25%, understandably because of the level of inflation in the world, because there has been a, an underfunding of the SDGs for many years, and the time is getting squeezed in which we have to now deliver that. And so, it leads to something like now a $176 trillion uh, of spending requirement. And the gap has gone up about 35% from $100 trillion uh, at, at last year's assessment to something like $135 trillion. If I put that into context, the world has uh, about $450 trillion US dollars worth of gross liquid assets from which they could fund that. These percentages are so big, and if you take the gap of $135 trillion and you add the security spend of 60, that's $200 trillion, what we're effectively saying is about half the money needs to go to the SDGs. Now, that's not really possible. And so we are set today to fail quite substantially in meeting the SDG goals by 2030, probably even longer than that. And so what needs to happen to, to address that? And the report looks at that in some detail across so many of the sections. Uh, I'm gonna summarize some of the work that we did on that to highlight uh, how the stakeholder groups involved in the system of capitalism that we have today are moving towards the model that could fund potentially the SDGs. So the first is we point to a multi-stakeholder consumer model of capitalism. And as Professor Kanduri was saying earlier, there is one aspect of this model which is unpriced and it's nature. So it's a, it's a free ingredient in most of the models 
almost all the models actually, that really underpin the system of capital. So who has the money and who can make the biggest difference? Uh, number one, households have the largest stock in some ways of capital to begin with. They're the owners of approximately 60%, just over 60% of the world's money. Um, governments have approximately just under 40% of the world's money. The finance industry manages this money on behalf of its clients and manages about 90% of the world's money. And corporations uh, have an enormous say, although their stock of capital doesn't compete with the others, you know, it's something like $60 trillion out of 450. It has an enormous influence because of its spending and its capital plans uh, and the direct investment flows that it, uh, it makes across the world. So these are at least four stakeholder groups that would have to align for capital to flow. And the finance industry, despite managing 90% of the world's capital, would argue that its, its clients need to allow it to allocate capital to projects with a different risk profile, with a different level of security therefore underlying it, and a different level of return profile for the short term. Longer term, that may be very different. Um, so there are at least four stakeholders that would need to collaborate to make a big difference. What we have noticed year on year, and we've been doing our, this study for approximately three years, looking at 450 data items of uh, policies that cover ESG, sustainability, and stakeholder engagement. And we do that in, in the last uh, study for 120 financial institutions, 30 of whom we have a qualitative engagement with too, to understand why they do what they do, what their intentions are, and how that might change over time. And what we notice is there is an enormous alignment around ESG policies and practices across these large financial institutions that you know, the 120 represent nearly half the world's money. And uh, they are committed to an ESG policy. What we have seen in the US though, is some states and some interest groups believe that ESG is actually detrimental to their stakeholders. And they, they wish the finance industry to step away from ESG. And there has even been an announcement by one of the biggest allocators of capital to blacklist financial institutions that follow ESG policies. Now, that would seem completely contrary to the findings that we have from this study, which I'll point to in a moment, and against the interest of the stakeholder groups, at least in the medium to longer term, and potentially shorter too. We find that the alignment between the largest financial institutions is, is very wide and quite deep, and it covers the most important topics that we would all look for, including climate change, carbon intensity, biodiversity, human rights, uh, inclusion, risk management, ethical practices, and so on. So there is quite a deep allocation. About $30 trillion are estimated amongst this, this very big group uh, to be aligned to, to ESG type practices and integrated into the AUM. But that's 30 million, 30 trillion out of nearly 400 trillion. So we have a long way to go. You know, this journey has really begun as opposed to, you know, we are at the peak of this journey. The allocation to sustainable development goals and sustainability more generally is quite widespread and it has been growing and quite substantially over approximately a, a 10 year period. And we, we see that because it's profitable to do so. And so the profit motive has really mattered. Uh, I want to keep reminding us that the profit that is calculated today has a free ingredient which, as Professor Kanduri said, um, is probably one of the most important ingredients in the profitability, and, that, and that's nature, the, the global commons. But the way it's measured today and reported today, and the way people are rewarded today, would suggest that actually it's profitable to fund sustainability in, in the current model, and that that is growing as a percentage. I, I would put this all into context. You know, it's one to three percent of the total four hundred fifty trillion dollars that is truly sustainability financing. And I put that into further context to say that it is geographically very diverse in the sense that there are many parts of the world where this, this capital is, is not being allocated. So not much of this capital flows to the global south where the SDGs are focused. A lot of this capital is spent in the richer countries addressing the issues within those richer countries 
or addressing climate issues, of course, which are global. Stakeholder engagement has become very important and the commitments have been acted on and, you know, over 90% of the financial institutions point to a commitment to stakeholder engagement from employees to local communities to the wider sh uh, shareholder and stakeholder groups, customers, suppliers, and so on. So the, the system itself is embracing stakeholders. But again, this is also contentious and has begun in the US where there is a lashback uh, in terms of requiring financial institutions to invest and focus their capital to a narrower definition of fiduciary duty, which is focused only on shareholder returns in some way. And so there is a battle actually beginning and being fought out uh, very gradually, but we're in the early stages of that too. In terms of SDG allocation, again, there is an enormous inequality about where the money goes. And the money goes to issues that we would expect. It goes to climate, it goes to work, uh, workplaces, uh, but it does not go to the more difficult areas of extreme poverty, hunger, uh, the oceans, and so on. So th there are big gaps in this allocation of capital. And for so and you know it makes some sense if we look at it this way. The financial institutions feel they have a mandate to operate their capital in the physical locality and to the mandates they have agreed as, as part of their strategies. And so they allocate it in the countries where they have presence. Now that doesn't help us. You know, we really need that mandate to be changed. So it is a global mandate, but there is no precedent yet that is strong enough where financial institutions have done that. Now, if I, if I come towards the end, you know, it is enormously profitable, we find, consistent with the previous two reports, to invest in sustainability. And that makes sense to us because those that are addressing the most complex issues are learning new skills, developing new capabilities and new competences. If you address these complex inclusion requirements, the S and the E in particular, then you learn skills that, are, that require you to go into new places, address these problems and do it profitably. And in doing that, you develop a skill set which allows you to magnify your impact in the industry and be just a superior organization to one that believes its main raison d'etre is just to process bits of paper that might be mortgage applications or loan applications or something else and to sell and distribute that product. And so there is a 6x performance in shareholder returns amongst those doing the most. Even if we are wrong by a factor, which we don't believe we are, uh, on a large factor, it is profitable to fund sustainability. I will um, only summarize this very busy last page to say the challenge is that the, the gap is large and so large, the system itself would have to change. And that requires a multi-stakeholder alignment around a plan where every stakeholder agrees to consume differently, to produce differently. Uh, and those two are big blocks that have not been tackled well enough. And you know, more than half of the largest corporations have not yet embraced ESG or the SDGs or net zero. So we have a big shift still to manage before we can actually fund the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ketani. It's really eye-opening to have this uh, holistic uh, review of uh, what is there in the business and financial sector, but also in uh, public finance in order to help with the transition, this unprecedented transition that we have to implement in a very short uh, period of time in order to become resilient against the global crisis. It is really very helpful to have reports such as yours in order to, to summarize and compile the different aspects of this, uh, of this effort and uh, to show that there is the potential for the change, but we need to uh, work hard in understanding how to implement this change. Thank you so much. Really, could I add one last point, which is- Yes, of you know, course. It, it sometimes appears that it, it is easier to get funding to go to Mars than it is to actually address the issues on the planet of health and poverty um, for the poor. That makes no sense. It means the system 
it is truly dangerous to the people that actually have the capital and are making the profits, not just those that don't have the capital. And so I have to believe that as we innovate more and as technology addresses the cost of addressing these issues and it come, becomes lower and lower, lower over time, it has to become profitable to distribute product all over the planet and to drive financial inclusion, education inclusion, digital inclusion, and to see prosperity increase because that cost is dropping very dramatically. And with my investment hat on, the most exciting opportunities I see, I see are technology-driven financial solutions for mass inclusion because it's you acquire new customers and you acquire them profitably now. And that will happen for education. And we see that too as an investor and we see it across the board. And, and, so, and the, sorry, go on. No, yeah. I was just going to say it, it, this, this idea that we cannot profitably fund education and finance and every other issue it is, is actually a, a false assumption, especially as technology con continues to become cheaper and give us more access across the world. And so, um, you know, you know, we've launched six initiatives to do that from Force for Good. And I believe others will keep doing this and we will create new profitable mechanisms to, to address the world's issues. Yeah, uh, I would say that they are already profitable in terms of the value they create, the value that education creates, for example, is huge. If, if you simulate its contribution in the medium and long run to gross national product, it's, it's huge. The big challenge is that this value sometimes goes unrecognized yes. because it cannot be captured privately. And yes. we need the mechanisms that allow this uh, capture uh, of, of, of the value, of the benefits of all this, uh, to be connected, this created by you to be connected to public and private and public private partnerships uh, so that all of the investors, the different investors in an economy uh, have an incentive compatible urge uh, to um, invest in, uh, in education and in uh, decreasing inequality and taking into account seriously the mass numbers that are there waiting for this upgrade in their welfare in the social, uh, in the global south. So the potential is huge. We just need to become clever in allowing the all kinds of investors to profit from uh, public goods so that they have an incentive to come in and offer them. Of course, we need to be very careful about the rules and regulations of that, but it is important, as you say, to understand that most money they were there in private hands and we need to let these private hands enter into the public good arena. Yes, agreed. Thank you. Uh, it's always so, so nice to talk to you, Kedan, because you bring this big picture into, you know, into an investment logic that makes it practical and uh, creates hope for, uh, you know, for uh, involving the right stakeholders in this transformation. Our next speaker is um, Ms. Elenia Romani, PhD researcher at FIM uh, that will present us an analysis of the um, RFF of Italy, a, a very detailed, thereabouts analysis uh, of uh, the Italian RFF. Elena, I'm really happy that you joined us. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, everyone, for, for giving FIM the opportunity to present its work in such an important platform. So, um, as Phoebe said, um, I, I will present this, um, this work titled Besides Promising Economic Growth, Will the National Recovery and Re Resilient Plan of Italy Also Produce uh, Fewer Emissions? Um, you, you can find um, that the original work has been uh, published online in the Journal of uh, Economic Policy, uh, co-authored together uh, with the Professor Galeotti and Professor Lanza by, by FIM. 
um, if, if we think of uh, the challenges uh, Europe has been addressing in these years, um, what comes to my mind is uh, climate change on the one hand and the COVID pandemics uh, on the other. So I'll, I start my presentation by briefly introducing the two main instruments linked to one another that the EU has put in place to address these challenges, the European Green Deal and the next generation EU. Um, the European Green Deal is our action plan to, to achieve a sustainable EU economy and to address uh, the decoupling challenge, hence by boosting economic growth while reducing emissions. And this is to be done by, they say, transforming the climate and environmental challenges into opportunities in all the economic sectors. And so this plan outlines uh, the investments needed and the financing tools available with the goal of uh, having a climate neutral EU by 2050. Uh, related to the second challenge, uh, the, the economic consequences of the pandemic crisis, uh, the, the main instruments put in place by the EU is uh, the next generation EU, uh, which is the largest stimulus package ever introduced in Europe. Um, it allocates almost 2 billion euros to Italy only. And uh, uh, this presentation will be precisely about the, the, the impact of these uh, funds, the, the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, NRP. Uh, NRRP sorry. Uh, the plan is uh, fully aligned with the European Green Deal. So we already see the in interconnections between these two instruments. In fact, 37% of uh, the plan's budget uh, will be spent uh, on fighting climate change. Also, it will follow the do no significant harm principle, and it has a specific mission, the number two, you can see it here, devoted to green revolution and ecological transition explicitly. And it has the, the highest amount of money allocated explicitly for mission number two. Um, but let's keep in mind that the primary ob objective of the recovery fund is, uh, as, as the name says, to prompt the post-pandemic economic recovery and reconstruction. Um, at the same time, um, for, for the reasons I've just, I've just explained, the plan represents a crucial opportunity to make the EU economy more sustainable and greener. But is there a trade-off between these two objectives? So economic growth on the one hand and green transition on the other. Uh, so we asked ourselves, what's the impact of the new EU funds for Italy on carbon emissions? And we, we tried to answer this question using the global economic model by Oxford Economics, doing a scenario analysis, uh, focusing on both the, the economic and the environmental impacts of the Italian recovery plan. So after assessing the instrument with the cross models and cross countries validation, we construct a number of scenarios and produce the relevant simulations. We start by uh, generating two different baselines. Baseline A, it projects macroeconomic variables forward from December 2019. So it does not take into account the COVID crisis. While the other baseline, it includes COVID as it starts from uh, May 2021. The scenario with the COVID is uh, decomposed into five different options. You can see them here. Uh, scenario B considers the pandemic crisis without the, introdu the introduction of the recovery plan. Scenario C considers only the investments of the plan, while scenario D includes both investments and reforms. Um, but what about the environmental dimension? To simulate this, uh, we created a green connotation of the investment by increasing the generation of electricity from renewable resources. Um, this increment is determined by considering the component two of the mission number two, which is aimed at increasing the share of energy produced from uh, renewable energy sources. So the, the Italian plan explicitly specifies uh, that uh, with the, the uh, measures funded by the plan, uh, they intend to um, increase uh, the expected generation from renewable resources, uh, uh, resulting in an increase of around 4,000 uh, gigawatt hour per year of uh, sustainable energy generation. Uh, the, the scenarios that does obtain, hence, are obviously COVID scenarios with the plan green investments, so scenario E, 
and uh, with the green investments and the reforms. So, so we, we work in this way in order to give, uh, as I said, the, the green connotations uh, to the funds uh, uh, of the Italian plan. So let's see uh, the, the results uh, uh, that this research produced. Um, Elena, so please, Elena, please try to go as fast up as possible because we have another five minutes less than and Theo uh, will close the session as well. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I briefly saw the, the results of these five scenarios on some variables of interest. Here we can see uh, the, the, the GDP and we see clearly a, a strong effect of the pandemic in the form of a drop in the, in the GDP. Uh, the positive effects of uh, the plan on, on the GDP can be, sees, can be seen in scenarios C and E uh, when compared to the scenario B in uh, light blue. And the, the finding is even stronger if we also include the effect of structural, structural reforms. If we move from the economic point of view to the environmental one, uh, here we can see uh, the impact uh, on energy consumption from fossil sources. Uh, the, the, the impact of COVID is evident. We see a big drop because uh, the limited economic activity caused energy consumption to fall. And after 2021, we see a mild recovery. Obviously, green investments, so scenarios E and F, determine a clear decrease in fossil fuel consumption, while non-green investments show an increase. Um, also notice that reforms, so scenarios D and F, lead in any case in an increase in energy demand. Uh, because they have a positive effect on, on GDP, but being just structural reforms, they don't include any specific re reference to any possible green dimension, so actually their impact on fossil energy consumption is positive. And uh, then let's turn finally to the um, environmental impact measured in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, and uh, what our simulation show is, is that emission plummet in parallel with the drop in economic activity and, economic, and, and sorry, energy consumption following the pandemic. And then they partially rebound when the economy recovers in the following year. The plan brings climate benefits only in the green version. Uh, without these green investments, the plan remains only a tool to boost production. Um, Finally, I'd conclude with a look at the degree of decarbonization of the Italian economy by looking at carbon intensity, which tells us how many emissions are generated per euro of GDP. Um, indeed, measures aimed at changing the energy mix in favor of less emissing, emissive fossil fuels favor a reduction in carbon intensity. We, we clearly see the substantial drop of the index due to, due to the combined effect of the significant increase in GDP and the observed reduction in emissions. The, the, this reduction is driven by the plan and obviously is most pronounced in the case of green investments. So wrapping up, uh, we can conclude that the fight against climate change, the, the commitments made by Italy under the Paris agreements and the obligations arising from the EU are already leading and even more will lead our authorities to important efforts to reduce emissions. We, we found that the green investments that are a substantial component of the plan will lead to a reduction of emissions, even if of very modest size. Uh, we can speculate, however, that the reduction is likely to get stronger after 2030, since these are largely investments in clear technologies and the climate benefits are likely to be substantial over the longer time horizon. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. Very informative, very detailed. And now I'm going uh, straight to uh, Theo Zachariadis, Professor. Uh, at the Cyprus Institute uh, to close uh, this uh, uh, session. Theo okay, will thank you talk very about much. The National Recovery and Resilience Plans in general. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, that's a, a compliment to, to what uh, Phoebe briefly described, but it's also a compliment to what. Um, uh, Ketan uh, showed about uh, private investments. Uh, in our work and in the latest report of the uh, Senior Working Group on SD of SDSN Europe 
or linking SDGs with the European Green Deal. Um, we mapped these discrepancies between public budgets and SDG scores with a case study from uh, the National Recovery and Resilience Plans. And uh, we did this uh, with a case study from seven South Europe member states, which all, read, uh, all together um, accounted for more than half of the actual grants that were provided from the so-called Recovery and Resilience Facility. First, we did um, an analysis for Spain and Italy. This is included in the flagship European report, Europe Sustainable Development Report. And then in our senior working groups report, we extended this analysis to seven countries, uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Slovenia, and Spain, which, as I said, account for more than half of the grants that are made available by this EU fund. To do this, we studied each country's recovery plan in detail, um, and uh, we tried to identify linkages with SDGs uh, uh, as regards the relevance of the, of the public investments uh, with the targets of the SDGs or the indicators that are used to compile the, the, the score of each SDG in the Europe Sustainable Development Report. And this is a graph that Vivi already showed. It shows the relevance of the recovery plans of the seven EU, South EU countries uh, <coughs> to different SDGs. What this means is that uh, mainly the recovery plans is already um, outlined by every speaker up to now, focus on digitization, clean energy, better infrastructure, and uh, some social aspects, but only some of them. And there is less attention uh, in public funds on more complex production and consumption systems that have to do with circular economy, with food and nature. At the same time, however, these European countries face significant challenges in uh, achieving progress towards SDGs exactly in these systems that are overlooked. And there is also less attention in public investments of the recovery funds uh, on promoting behavioral change in the population. <clears throat> so that's why, as Phoebe mentioned in the beginning, the SDG-related assessment of public and private investments can offer really a holistic frameworks that uh, can, um, can provide an input to uh, uh, policy recommendations as it has both environmental and social aspects for the transition to sustainability. We have also provided um, um, a framework to mainstream SDGs in economic policy, combining ex post assessments of sustainability performance, such as the ones that are already available in the different dashboards of SDSN or EU or the OECD, with ex ante assessment of public budgets, such as the ones that the one that I presented and is included in our report. And this can lead to gaps towards SDG achievement, and this can lead to recommendations for public policy that can inform both public uh, investments, decisions of public investments, but also uh, it can inform public decisions on support to specific uh, uh, e private investments in line with sustainable finance principles. Let me stop here and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Theo, for uh, efficiently presenting all this very important work because it can really form the basis for budget, budget allocations and that's why it is uh, very useful. Uh, on this note, uh, unfortunately, time is never enough. Uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody who is contributing to the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. This is our 10th anniversary. And of course, our deepest uh, gratitude goes to all the 1,600 institutional members that uh, work uh, towards uh, the implementation of the SDGs. And of course, Jeff Sachs, the, uh, his amazing leadership, his uh, strength and power to mobilize all these people around the world, the hundreds of thousands of people that are involved in these 1,600 institutions that are SDSN members. Thank you all so much. Let's try to make this change.